All right. Like we said yesterday, we do have a second video on related rates, and we're going to just try to go a little more in depth and get a little bit stronger. And like we said last week in class, our philosophy on all these topics is uh, we don't want to just simply practice them until we can get them right. We want to practice them until we can't possibly get them wrong, and we just want to really graduate to that expert level. The one thing I want to emphasize here as we get going is, and I thought we did a really nice job of this in class yesterday, and I just want to continue to reemphasize it is the fact that we cert we've got to make sure that we're differentiating these functions with respect to t before we substitute any of these values into those variables, okay? Emphasis on differentiating before we substitute. So, But like I said, we, we did a very good job of that, so very optimistic, just wanted to reemphasize it. And again, one of the traits that I want to uh, kind of build within us throughout the year is just the ability to be flexible and to think kind of outside the box and to just really be have the freedom to think and not be, you know, too robotic in nature. Um, and I think that's one of the qualities that's made us so strong over the last few years. So we're talking about the area of an equilateral triangle, and this is certainly a problem that, I, you know, I don't think we've done anything similar to this one before, so we're going to really have to think on our feet and, and be willing to take some risks here and maybe go down a few dead-end roads before we find the successful path. But anyway, they just said that the area of this equilateral triangle is increasing at a rate of 5 meters squared per hour. So I'm going to, you know, just sketch my equilateral triangle here. And, of course, we do know that all the sides are equal, and we've got our height right here. And so I'm thinking here, of course, the area of any triangle since we were in first grade is one-half times its base times its height. But the problem is both the base and the height are increasing. And, and similar to that inverted cone problem we saw yesterday, um, we know that uh, you know right now the area is being expressed in terms of two variables. And if we differentiated right now, we'd have to use product rule. Okay, And there's nothing wrong with product rule. We used product rule on a problem last night, I think the area of the rectangle. There's nothing wrong with product rule, but sometimes you get so many variables going and so many unknowns, and they didn't give us enough information to plug into all those unknowns. So really what my goal is, just like the cone problem, is I want to eventually rewrite this area formula so that's in terms of either just the base or just the height. So let's investigate that relationship, shall we? We do know that the angle... All three angles are 60 degrees, and we know we've got our height, and we know that the height bisects the base, so the distance from here to here would be one half of the original base. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up, I'm going to use a little bit of trigonometry here, and I'm going to say to myself that the tangent of 60 degrees equals the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. We do know that the tangent of 60 degrees is radical 3 and now all I'm going to do is I'm going to cross multiply and I'm going to say radical 3 over 2 times the base equals the height. And that's the relationship that we know is in, um, has to be true no matter how big or how small that triangle grows. Now we eventually want to know the rate at which the height is changing. So we want this to be, uh, we want the area strictly in terms of h. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually solve this little equation here for the base so I can do my substitution 2 over radical 3 times h. And I'm just going to simply substitute that into here. And now I've got my new formula. We've got 1 half times 2 over radical 3 h times the original h. We'll clean this up just a touch. And I've got 1 over radical 3 times h squared. Now we've got the area in terms of h only. We haven't done any calculus yet. And now we are free to differentiate. And we're going to differentiate with respect to time. And we've got 2 over radical 3 times h times dh dt. Okay, now let's analyze what was given to us. We do know, let's see, what did they say up here? They gave me the dA dt, all right? So that's going to go in for dA dt. Find the rate at which the height's changing when the air, ooh, okay, this is a bear trap. So we're going to say, okay, at the moment, if we're going to pause this movie at the moment when the area is 64 over radical 3, we have to ask ourselves, what was the height at that same moment? So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to go back to this little formula here, and I'm going to say, I'm going to substitute a 64 over radical 3 in for this a. And I'm going to simply solve for h. And what you'll notice is I, the radical 3's do cancel each other out, and the square root of both sides, that gives me a height of 8. So at the moment when the area was 64 over radical 3, the height at that same moment was 8, and that's what I'm going to substitute in my, into my derived formula. Okay, so dA dt was a 5, 
and we've got 2 over radical 3, and we just said the height has to be 8, and now I have the freedom to solve for dh dt. Let's see, um, that's 5 equals 16 over radical 3. I'm going to multiply both sides, whoops, I forgot the radical. I'm going to multiply by radical 3 over 16, and it's going to give me 5 radical 3 divided by 16. Let's see, what would the units be? Let's go meters per hour, and that's my dh dt. So I hope you like that one. we got two more to try. Here's one of those real famous street light problems in the sidewalk, and we're going to t take a look at the rate at which the length of the shadow is increasing. These problems were real popular in the 80s, and then they kind of disappeared for a while, and all of a sudden they're making a comeback on the AP exam. So, so we're going to start to revisit them a little more than I, than I used to cover them when I uh, began teaching calculus. But, so we've got this street light right here, and here's our sidewalk. And we'll say that it casts the light down through here. And we've got uh, Jonathan, who is seven feet tall. Whoa, big rascal. So there's Jonathan. He's seven feet tall. The street light was 15 feet above the sidewalk. All right, and, and Jonathan's walking away from the light at a rate of five feet per second. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, let's let X represent the distance between the street light and Jonathan. Okay, so if Jonathan's walking at a rate of 5 feet per second, we're going to say that dx dt equals positive 5 feet per second. And the reason I said positive is because he's walking away from the street light, light, therefore the length of x is increasing. If he was walking towards the street light, then I would say dx dt was a negative 5 feet per second, but that's not the case. Okay, so, and I'm going to throw in another variable here. Let's let y equal the length of the shadow. So just to define my two variables, x only represents the length between the streetlight and Jonathan, and then y represents the length of Jonathan's shadow. And the first thing they want me to do, and it really doesn't involve any calculus at all, is they wanted me to determine a function that relates the length of Jonathan's shadow to the distance from the base of the streetlight. So I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I have two similar right triangles, and I'm just going to set up a proportion. And I'm going to say, um, for instance, I could say 7 is to y, as 15 is to what? Okay, I'm going to challenge you to think about that right there. What would be the equivalent piece? It would be the sum of both x and y. I'm going to now cross multiply. And we'll just kind of subtract the 7y over. And here's, here's my answer for part A. I said 7 times x is equivalent to 8 times y, and that'll be true no matter how far or how long Jonathan walks for. Now for part B, they want to actually now, now we're going to actually do some calculus. How do you know we're doing calculus? Well, I saw the word rate, and that's basically our trigger. And they said determine the rate at which Jonathan's shadow is lengthening. Okay? In other words, they want me to figure out what is dy dt. That is the ultimate question here. At the moment, when he's 20 feet from the base of the light, a <laughs> little bear trap here. We're going to find out here gradually that that 20 is irrelevant, extraneous information. So anyway, let's go ahead and derive the formula we just found in part A. So that would be 7 times dx dt equals 8 times dy dt. And I'm solving for dy dt. Let's see. We do know that dx dt is 5, so I can substitute that. So we'll say 7, whoops, 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 grab the pen. There we go. 7 times 5, and then uh, we'll gra grab that 8 here in a moment and divide it over. So we've got 35 divided by 8, and this would be feet per second. And you'll notice the 20 that they threw into the word problem did not even come into play because after I took the derivative, there were no x's or y's in my formula to be used. But anyway, so this describes the rate at which the length of the shadow is increasing. And I think you could, you've probably experienced this in your real life. Um, if you took a step away from the light, po light source, and maybe the length of your stride was, I don't know, maybe two feet long, you actually saw a, a bigger jump in the length of the shadow um, than simply two feet. And uh, so that's why this answer seems to make sense to me, and I buy it that it's reasonable. Well, we certainly saved the best for last year. And as we read through this lengthy problem, we're d trying to imagine a spy that's tracking a rocket through his telescope to determine its velocity. So what I'm picturing here is I'm picturing the spy kind of hiding out over here. And I'm going to say here's my launching pad, so to speak, and here comes the rocket shooting straight up. And so I'll just I'll use R for the distance that the rocket's traveled. And then we've got this telescope that is spotting that rocket as it grows and it travels higher and higher and higher. So what I'm going to use is um, I'll use X for the distance between the spy and the launching pad, I'll use a Y to represent the length between the 
uh, spy in the top of the rocket. Okay, now it says the rocket is traveling vertically from a launching pad located 10 kilometers away. So X is 10. And ladies and gentlemen, in the first time in these two videos, we finally have ourselves a constant. All right, so let's make a little asterisk there and remind ourselves that that is a constant. The length of that side, the distance between the spine and the launching pad, is not changing, and we're going to definitely take advantage of that. Now, at a certain moment, the spy's instruments show that the angle between the telescope and the ground is equal to, and this was supposed to say, pi over 3. I just couldn't write it in earlier. So then we'll put that right here. We've got pi over 3. Now, it's not always pi over 3. It just happens to be pi over 3 for one precise moment. So I want to just emphasize that we'll call that angle theta, and it just happens to be pi over 3 for one instantaneous moment, but it certainly is not always that angle. And it happens to be growing or changing at a rate of 0.5 radians per minute. Notice we're always working in radians at all times in this class. So here's what I know. I know that d theta, dt, is equal to 0.5 radians per minute. Okay, so what do we want to find out? We want to find out the rocket's velocity. Now, velocity, again, is just another way of saying what is the you know, rate at, the, at which it's changing. So we want to ultimately figure out what is dr dt. dr dt represents the velocity of the rocket. It's just the rate at which that length is changing. And so we need to set up, um, you know, you ask yourself, should I be using the Pythagorean theorem? You know, I'm staring at a right triangle. It seems like I'd use the Pythagorean theorem. But the problem is we need to incorporate these angles. Okay, we certainly, we have, we have some sides involved, but we also have some angles involved. And there's one aspect in, in math that relates and bridges the gap between sides and angles, and that's trigonometry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to pick out of my three primary trig functions, sine, cosine, and tangent, I'm going to pick out the best one. And what I noticed here is I want to take advantage of the fact that I have a constant, and then I also have to incorporate this side because the dr dt is what I'm trying to find. Now, with relation to this angle, that's going to be tangent. So I'm going to say that the tangent of theta equals r divided by 10. Now, you'll notice I had to call theta theta because it's a variable. I had to call r r because it's a variable. But I was able to substitute the 10 directly in for x because it's a constant. That's the only time that that's a legal move. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to rewrite that as 1 tenth times r. And I think it's going to help your, your derivative out. We're now ready to derive. We're going to say secant squared of theta times what? Yeah, d theta dt. Just remind yourself that we did use chain rule there. Theta was the inner function. And it's going to be 1 tenth times r to the 0, which is simply 1, times dr dt. Okay. So now the trick becomes to see if we can fill in all the unknown information here. Now remember that we paused it at the moment when the theta was pi over 3 or 60 degrees. So we're going to say, I'm actually going to rewrite that as 1 over the cosine of pi over 3 quantity squared. And d theta dt was the 0.5, I believe. And we got our one tenth, and then we got our dr dt that we're trying to solve for that represents the rocket's velocity. Let's see, the cosine of 60 is one half. If I square it, it's one fourth, and if I reciprocate it, I get a four. Four times this 0.5 here is going to be simply two. And then, by golly, if we simply multiply both sides by 10, I'm going to get 20. And r was measured in, oh shoot, I better check my units here. Kilometers, kilometers, I believe it was. 20 kilometers per minute. Boy, that sucker's moving, but certainly you'd expect a pretty fast pace for a rocket. So 20 kilometers per minute is the velocity of the rocket at that one moment in time. So hope you felt good about these angles. We'll certainly practice them some more. And uh, by the end of tomorrow, we will be rock stars. We will be experts at related rates.